It's really good to have Dave and Sue Cathy with us. Um, they're a great couple. And I'm not saying that just because we share, we share four grandchildren together. <laughs> Sue is my son's mother-in-law. We don't have mother-in-law jokes in our family. <laughs> not going to have any, any this morning. Um, but we've got to know them, as you would expect, uh, quite closely over the last 20-odd years, going across to Brussels and back. Uh, and uh, they've done a They've seen, they've overseen, if you like, a great work there that started very small and is now sort of medium size in their vision, I think. There's more to come. <laughs> um, and, uh, and our heart in this church is for, for God to bring a, build a strong, local, healthy church, but to reach out into OX18 and beyond. That's our heart. Um, and actually that chimes quite well with their heart for their area of Brussels um, and so well I'm sure there's loads of stuff we can learn from them um, and to hear a story that I'm sure has its plenty of ups and downs none of these paths are straightforward um, and uh, but it would just be uh, be great if we could open our hearts to Sue this morning, um, to welcome her, to welcome her for what she brings, to, to just have our ears open. Is there something for me and is there something for us? And most importantly for all, is there something for the area in which God has put us in? So can we welcome Sue? Is there anybody apart from me who's here for the first time this morning, by any chance? Oh, amazing. I'm so, so glad you're there. Um, it's always a bit strange, isn't it, when you come into a, a new place, you feel a bit like an alien, and you sort of want to go to the back and just observe, but here I am at the front, standing here with all of you looking at me. So, um, yeah, thank you. It's great to be here. It's going to have a fun time together. I just brought my little friend, Squeaky. Um, just to remind me, I, I do the kids' work sometimes. This is squeaky that I do. and he, Yeah, yeah, this is a really nice-looking congregation here. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they'll be very good. Yeah, they'll listen to me. Yeah. Okay. Then in the end, he just says too much that I have to put into one side. Is that okay if I put it there? I'm not going to put the piano on. Um, <laughs> the story of our church is really, who would have thought it? Oh, I haven't got the, um, where's the? You've got it. If you've got the, I need the. Uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John. I, I, can, I can put it on. It's, if it's green, it's on. If it's green, it's on. Okay. So I've just called it Who Would Have Thought It? Because actually, what's been happening in, in Brussels through us is just, I mean, I would never have dreamt it. Who, who would have dreamt? that when Dave and I went to Brussels, which was um, 42 years ago now, we would never have dreamt what's happened, what God has done. We went without any sort of pretension at all. But God has just done amazing things. But just to give you a little bit of, of the background, so I'm Sue, I'm married to Dave. We've been living in Brussels, as I said, for 42 years. Dave say we met at university. Dave was studying geotechnical... Oh, this is, is this making funny noises. Do I need to just, I, oh, is that better? Thank you. Um, can you still hear me? Anyway, it's not too big a room, is it? Um, I, we were both at Bristol University. I studied French, and Dave studied geotechnical civil engineering. And we were both converted at university. And then we met, we got, got married, and we celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary last year. Dave deserves a medal. I used to say it was me that deserved the medal, but I've sort of mellowed with my age, and I say now it's him. He deserves the medal for having been married to me for, for 50 years. So, so now we, we have six children, four biological children, two adopted children, and we have 17 grandchildren, which is quite, quite a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, we deserve clap for that. Well done. And we're part of the leadership team in Brussels, in the Brussels church. Um, when we moved to, to Brussels um, 42 years ago, the statistics said that there was just 1% of evangelical Christians in Belgium. 
I don't know if it was quite as few as that, but there, wasn't, there weren't masses and masses of thriving local churches as we would know local churches. Um, so that was quite... Well, we went there because basically when I had been... I'd studied French and I'd been I'd seen France as a bit of a mission field and then God led us towards um, Belgium. So that, that was sort of many, many years ago. Uh, just a little bit more information about us. Dave's quite a keen jogger. Garmin, have you got, is that right? He uses a Garmin app for those of you that know about that. He follows different programs. I go jogging a little bit. But actually, I'm a bit creative. So sometimes my garden looks amazing and sometimes it's just too much. So it doesn't look amazing at all. It's in the non-amazing stage at the minute. Um, I quite like sewing. I got into sewing a little while back. You know, the um, great British sewing bee with Patrick Grant and Esme Young, you know, you see what they're doing. You think, oh, I could do that. I made a few um, dresses for the granddaughters. And recently, um, I have started wallpapering. I've gone into interior design. There's that program called BBC Interior Design Masters with the lady called Michelle Ogundahin. I mean, amazing. I mean, amazing. And that sort of creates, you know, that sort of stirs up the creative juices in me to want to be that. But I... <laughs> We've been in our house for ages, and I just got fed up with um, walls just painted. They weren't magnolia, but um, <laughs> I just got fed up, so I thought I'll put some um, wallpaper on the walls. It used to be quite tre on trend to have one sort of feature wall. It probably isn't anymore. I usually catch up with what's on trend when it's just not on trend anymore. You know, it's like the trousers and everything. You know, it used to be skinny jeans, and then I caught up with skinny jeans, and now I think it's wider trousers, and I'm not quite there yet. And when it's something else, I'll be wearing the wider trousers. But anyway, I'm not... <laughs> I like to think I like that. So we... Anyway, so our personal story, as I said, who would have thought? Who would have thought it? Who would have thought that God would have taken us to Brussels without any pretensions? We just wanted to go there because we realised that in France, there was a lack of variety and expression of local Christianity. And we discovered some people that had been quite um, disappointed in the Catholic Church. And so they sort of said, we can't, we can't stay here. But then they hadn't got anywhere else to go. Whereas within, when we'd been converted at university, if you had a bit of a bust up with the Anglicans, you could become a Baptist. And if you didn't get on too well with what the Baptist minister was doing, you could go and join the Pentecostals. If it was the Pentecost, so there's a bit of choice. So you didn't have to get out to fellowship with all other Christians just because there was something in your local church that you didn't like. And we just thought, well, let's try and let's let's see what we can do. Let's just go and be ordinary Christians. That's all we wanted to do: be part of a local church and just say, look, hey, we're Christians, normal, just an average couple with a few kids. Let's just be Christians with you together. Um, so we went to, to Brussels, we had two boys who were five and three, Jonathan and Daniel, and our daughter Anna, who was three months when we went there. Um, who would have thought, you know, that later on we would have been participants in cre creating a th thriving church and French-speaking church? Somebody I was talking to yesterday, it's a French-speaking church. It's very easy in Brussels, international, to create big um, English-speaking churches. That really is easy. It's not a problem. But French-speaking, that's a bit more difficult. And there are sort of, you get the sort of Congolese churches, lots of Congolese people, or other churches that are sort of more ethnic type, more sort of one nationality, more or less. But to have something that's international, we've got about 20, 20 at least 20 different nationalities in our church. That is quite unusual, French-speaking. We were trying to, we always felt called to the people who who had sort of integrated into Brussels life. Not the expats, but integrated into Brussels life. So when we left Bristol, we went to Cardiff. And we sort of, before that, we tried to push some doors to see if God would open doors to Belgium, and he didn't. But then after a while, we pushed again, and Dave found a job. It was, he didn't, wasn't a job change, because he was a, a lecturer at Cardiff University. And then he changed... He sought a job in Brussels, and it just so happened he wrote to a company that said, oh, yeah, we are recruiting, and the door just was wide open. So um, we sold our house in Cardiff. It seemed logical at the time. Looking back, maybe it wasn't so, you know, most people who move abroad keep their house, they rent it out. But we just thought, okay, we'll sell it. That just seems we'll have the money. Thanks very much, Lord. Um, 
And it didn't seem particularly admirable or pioneering or like we were doing anything very different. But actually, looking back, maybe it was a bit of a step of faith and um, you know, something that not everybody would have done. Because now when people go abroad with a bit of a call to take the gospel... There's usually a lot of preparation. You get people praying for you, people visiting you, pastoral visits. We had no, none of that at all. None of that at all. It was quite dry. We joined with a, a local evangelical church. And at that point, you've got to realise, before lots of people were here were born, there was much more of a... Um, churches like this, there were churches like, like this, a few, but most churches were sort of traditional. They Even raising your hands... I mean, was not very well thought of, you know, let alone gifts of the Spirit, um, speaking in tongues. I mean, that would, whoa, now, no, no, no. And so, we, but we joined a church where none of these things were um, accepted, really. But because we believed in the, in the local church, it's so important for Christians to be in the local church. And what unites us, even with people who think doctrinally differently, is so important. So we just joined that church. But it was a bit of a, a dry time for us. And then somebody, uh, one of our friends came and said, you really need to go to the Downs Bible Week, which became Stonely Bible Week. So we, we went there and that was our annual oasis. And it was brilliant. I just want to show you, for those who perhaps don't know, that is where Belgium is, um, just in case. You know, you get people thinking, I've had it here, people who say, oh, yeah, Belgium, is that, is that the capital of France? I've, really, this was somebody who just had no idea. So Belgium is sort of, uh, to the north is, is Holland, to the south is France. You can see where London is, it's not that far away. Two hours in the Eurostar from St Pancras to uh, uh, Brussels and then to the east You've got um, Luxembourg first and then Germany. So that's, that's where that is. And then what's my next picture? Oh, I know. I'm sorry. It's that way, isn't it? And that's just the uh, Grand Place, which is the really amazing centre of Brussels. It's really worthwhile visiting. It's not as beautiful as Bruges. Maybe some of you have been to Bruges, but it's still a, a nice place. It's a lovely place to visit. So... I don't know, has anybody here been to summer camps? Any of you young people, anybody been to Bible Week summer camps? They're amazing, aren't they? I mean, oh, just great. We spent, I don't know how many years we spent going to Bible camps. It was the one thing that we did every summer, first four with three kids and with four kids and then with some more kids and they went to the youth and the kids. They got baptised in the spirit there. It's brilliant. Well, when we were there, particularly at, at Downs and Stoney, what really struck us was the emphasis that the, this organisation, we're called NFI, New Frontiers International, they put a huge emphasis on church planting. And we kind of got it. We kind of got it that church planting was God's, church was God's plan. Local church was God's plan for the for the world, really, to, to touch people. It wasn't just one-to-one -one evangelism. It was, it, was, it, was, it was churches. And I remember Terry, Terry Verga once said, he was the leader of this movement called NFI, or New Frontiers International. And he said, we try and say to all of our young people that they need to expect to be part of a church plant. So if you're a young person here, maybe that's a challenge for you. And don't think you've got to be somebody super, super special to be part of a church plant. You know, maybe at some point, I think there's been some word around here to say you're going to touch the towns and villages. So maybe some of you in one year's time, two years' time, three years, you won't be here. You'll be in another, another Carterton, which isn't quite like this, different faces, but with the same joy, with the same life, with the same love, with the same presence of God. We need to be mobile. It's very interesting that people are willing to be mobile for their jobs. Lots of people for, will, do, will be mobile for a career move. And I read somewhere that that's how you actually go up the ladder um, professionally, is you have to be willing to move. Should we be willing to move for God's kingdom? Yeah. Should we be willing to move for God's kingdom? So the young people, 12, 13, 14, 15, and up a bit, up to 25s or whatever. I think you don't become young. If you're, if you're married at 25, you're no longer young. If you're unmarried at 25, you're still young. It's sort of, it's sort of something to do with whether you're... I don't know. It's weird, isn't it? It's weird. And everybody wants to be young. And nobody, until you get to a certain point, when you don't want to be old either. You know, so it's just weird, this thing, isn't it? Anyway, just, um, just keep that in your heart. 
that for the kingdom of God, moving is quite important. It's quite important. So um, and I, just, and I just do want to say, often it's just a question of being there. No matter your gifting. Today, there's an awful lot about um, the, having the right team with you. And I'm not um, negating that. That's the ideal. But the reality for most of us is that people don't have much time. You haven't got the right gifts. It would take three years to prepare them. And sometimes all you have to do is just go and be there. All you want is somebody who could put out the chairs, um, perhaps play the piano a little bit, but that doesn't matter too much. You can make the coffee. This is the sort of people we need for church planting. We don't need the, you know, the prophets and the apostles and all these brilliant people. You know, we weren't that at all. We just went there and did it. And by this time, we'd changed to a different church, which was more like this church here, with more like the Salt and Light, Roots and Rivers, like Carterton or like Whitney, all that. And, um, and they released us to, to go and church plant. So we started off in our living room once a month. Um, we were about 15 of us. There were two couples with children. That was me and Dave and another couple. And a whole lot of people, well, a whole lot six or seven people from the other church who were actually just a bit fed up with it on the whole. They just thought it would be more exciting. They didn't like it. They didn't think much of the, you know. Anyway, so they came to join us. But actually, after not very long, they left, you know. So we were left with not so many people. Rich always, Richard, um, like John said, our son-in-law, sort of always says there was about 10 people in our living room when he came. I don't think that's quite true. I think he's slightly <laughs> underestimating numbers. We were more than 10. We were more like 16. But, I mean, we certainly weren't 25. Um, so we started, and I'm going to just show you a, a film in a, in a minute. So we started, when we started to outgrow our living room, we went to this kind of bar, pub type place, which had a little stage on it where we put our musicians, the guitarist. Um, and... They sort of used to do concerts there in the evening. And the next day, of course, when we arrived on the Sunday morning, it was a bit, smelled a bit beery, and there was sort of beer. But anyway, we stayed there for about a year. Um, then we went to a garden centre, which had a nice, nice room, which was quite pleasant, except the children were in the kitchen on a stone floor. They were both in the kitchen, I think, the older ones, and the babies were sort of in the entranceway by the door. It was freezing. It wasn't brilliant. Um, and then finally we went to a... a a Catholic complex greeted us and welcomed us, and we had a room about this size, actually, and about this shape. So this seems very, very familiar to me. Um, and it was great. And they welcomed us for six to seven years, and it was absolutely brilliant. And it was in big grounds, and that was, that was brilliant, until we got our own building. But let me just, if you'd like, show the video. This is just gives some idea about our, our journey.
the, the, the Brussels sprouts there, it's because we had a prophecy from Bryn Franklin. He came here, I think, and gave you to say that in Brussels, he saw us, he saw seven, this was ages ago, 10, 15 years ago, and he saw a plate of Brussels sprouts that would have, have sort of one strong stem and there'd be others spread out. And that's what we believe God is doing to us. I think he came and he gave you, it's him that gave you that quite significant prophecy about you're going to reach the towns and villages. It's, it's so encouraging, isn't it? Because sometimes you can feel, maybe you had that in your heart already, but sometimes you can feel so arrogant to say, we're going to reach all the towns and villages around Carterton. You think, who are we? Carterton? You know, are we just like CCB? We're called CCB, Christian Community of Brussels. We thought, that is so arrogant to think that we want to spread out. But actually, when God comes and gives you a prophetic word, you think, no, it's not arrogant. It's just God that's doing it. And uh, he does want us to, um, to think big. So the building that we bought four years ago was already a community centre. I'm just going to what's next. The next thing's coming up here. Right, yeah, okay. I'll do that in a minute. Because through prayer and through discussion and sharing vision together and understanding what our church had, we really felt that we wanted not to buy a church building, but we wanted to buy a community centre that had a room big enough for the church on a Sunday morning and had other rooms for the kids, but that during the week it would be totally, totally open to anybody. That was, our, that was our heart. So we were never looking for a church building that could be used for the community. It was the other way around. And we spent about 10 years looking for something. We made various um, initiatives, you know, put in for planning permission, permission from the commune, from the local council, and it was always sort of no. And then, and then four years ago, something just opened up, just opened up, and in the space of three days... We put in an offer. We saw it on the Monday, and on the th- on the Wednesday we put in an offer, and we told the church afterwards, which is not what I would recommend. <laughs> We've actually decided to spend your money here, but because we'd been through it so many times, we'd been through. Okay, let's look at this, and they said, "Yeah, we're for it," and and that one didn't work out. Looked at another building, yeah, we're for it, and that one didn't work out. This was a better building, and it was cheaper. So actually, we knew we could go ahead, and everybody was delighted with it. But that is sort of that is quite good leadership that we felt we could do it, and know to know that the church the church was with us, and we didn't have any complaints at all. So. And we wanted the community centre, as you can imagine, here, so that there could just be people coming in during, during the week, and they would know the building, and, and they would feel comfortable talking to us. It's so interesting, really, that because people know it's a community centre that's um, hosted, shall we say, by the church, although people that rent it, that from all sorts of... They, we're not asking for people from the church to do it. We have, we have Italian groups, we have mothers and baby, um, baby signs, signing, signing language, we have Pilates, we have grief counselling, we have all sorts of stuff going on there. They're not people from the church doing it, so it's open to all. But it's interesting, when people come in, they're, because they know it's Christian, they just often just start to talk about stuff. And they like the vision. We say this vision of our community centre, of this building, is to be a blessing to the community. And we bought it just before COVID. So, you know, we were thinking we'd say, welcome, everybody. And all the message was, keep away from one another. You know, so our idea of having a church, of having a building that would bring people together, that didn't quite work out as we'd hoped. Um, But it was just... I think here you had something called pufflinks. Is that right? You know, and that's exactly the sort of what we were... Let's move that away. Is that better? Can you still hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, that's exactly what we... Exactly what you did here with pufflinks was our vision for our community centre. You have natural contacts with people and they actually become well disposed towards Christians. They become well disposed towards the church and... That's, that's our vision, to do it with all sorts of generations. All, yeah, the older people, we want to have them in. We had a game, so we played, it wasn't Scrabble. I think we played Uno and Dobble, that's right. But, you know, the idea is to get people in and then we can have those natural conversations and people see that Christians and our God is amazing. <laughs> um, I want to go to this. Oh, yeah, and I just wanted to, yeah, read that, that verse because that's so true, you know, that... that 
I call to mind, therefore I have hope, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They're new every morning, great is your faithfulness. That's a story. That's a story. And we have tried to create a culture of compassion and of grace in the church. We are not pernickety. We are not restrictive. We really want people to be themselves and to feel at home. And compassion is something that the world is a bit lacking on in the minute. You know, if you're a little bit different, a little bit neurodiverse, a bit atypical, there's not much space for you in some places. The church has to be a welcoming place. That's what we want to be, compassion. So compassion and grace are really, really important to us. Oh, sorry. And the next one. To the, to, the, to the computer? Oh, it's gone. Okay. This is something else I want to do. I've got all these glasses here. I um, don't know how many of you... you know, when I was 18, I haven't got bad eyesight. All right? and that was fine, and I wore contact lenses for ages. But then it started to be... And I could really see quite well in the distance. I could see quite well close to. And then it got a bit more complicated because I couldn't see... In order to see far, I couldn't see near... So I've got all these pairs of glasses, you know, so this, these ones are, no, these are far vision. These ones are my near vision ones. And these ones, okay, which haven't got anything, it's okay, that hasn't got anything in there. <laughs> it's because I've got one at the minute, I've got a contact lens here so I can see you, and nothing here so that I can read my notes, which is how I kind of function. But when I want to drive, <laughs> I have to put these on, okay, because this one's got the contact lens in so I can see far. And this has got the... I mean, it's crazy. It, it's absolutely crazy. And it's really complicated. I'm always changing my glasses all the time. And, I lose, and the worst thing is I lose them as well. I mean, I'm not, your hus my husband will tell you that, that, you know, I'm not very good. When I had my cafe, there was a picture of what was called Lounge 81. I was always losing my keys. And they were always saying to me, Sue, here are your keys. And in the end, we put up a little uh, hook where I would hook them up. But anyway, it's very complicated. But... You know, I think that God um, wants us to see the big picture. He wants to give us glasses so we can see really well a long way ahead and what's in front of our nose. He wants that for the church. He wants us to have these really good glasses so we can see a long, long, long way ahead and at the same time look after what he's given us, look after our local church. That is so important. And it's, I was just thinking, it's not just in church, is it? It's your family as well. When you're busy changing their nappies and they've been sick again and you've just got ready to go out and they're sick all over you and oh, all that sort of stuff or poo or whatever it might be. <laughs> you know, and you think, oh no. And it doesn't seem that you're raising an amazing man or woman of God for later. It just sees, oh no but it's the little that counts. For those of you who are students, don't neglect the small things now. I don't know, does anybody want to be, I don't know, a doctor? Anybody who hopes to be a doctor? Or a pilot? Or a nurse? Or what are your dreams? What are your dreams, you young people here? What are you hoping to be? Anybody shout something out? Any idea what else have I got written down here? Musician, anybody wants to be a musician? <laughs> Actor, basically, is what we do now in the short term that defines who will be in the future. And it's exactly the same thing in the church. What we can see now, what we sow into now, that will have its results in the future. And I've just got some of these verses here. Oh, sorry. Oh, gosh, I'm not very good at this. Um, so it's a culture. I've called it a culture of far and near. It's a culture of far and near. The far is when Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. That is the far. That is the far. We've all got our own little sphere in which we work that out. For you in Carterton, for this church, it's the towns and villages around here. For us in Brussels, it's the, we believe it's Belgium. We've actually changed our name. It's CCB, Community Christian de Brussels. And we've actually, in our statutes, changed it to Christian Community Belgium. Works well. We don't have to change our logo because it's still the B again. And, um, but that is what we, uh, we, we think God wants us to dream big and see much more than Brussels, but to see Belgium. And for you, much bigger than Carterton, isn't it? It's seeing the far, seeing what you can do. Um, 
But also, and there's also the be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, and then rule over. It's that the fish and the birds and the animals. God wants us to see big. He wants us to take care of this earth. It's a big, big mandate to exploit stuff that is in the earth. I was, I was thinking that it's, um, it's like God, when he did creation, it's like he gave a, a paint box. If you can imagine that, it's like he gave to Adam and Eve, he gave to us all a big box of paints. So there's the raw material there, but he wants us to do the drawing. He wants us to, to take those paints and do something beautiful with it. It's the same thing with the earth that he's given us. He wants us to do good things, to take what the raw materials and make something beautiful. So there's a big, big things, but it needs to be worked out in daily Christian living. So there's the verses like, love one another as I've loved you in John 13, 34. Love your enemy, do good to those who hate you. I think you've been looking at Philippians. This is a good verse, isn't it? I bet you underline this. Do everything without complaining or arguing. That's in Philippians. <laughs> God, starting at home. Oh, yeah, I think we're probably at our worst at home, aren't we, most of us, with our, with our spouses or with our parents or with our kids, you know. Oh. Uh, without complaining. We, have, we live a different sort of Christian life, but that's working it out in the near. Um, and, of course, we love God and we're for his glory. Um, Let's just see what's the next thing. Okay, and then I want to talk about a culture of something is better than nothing. This is supposed to be a fish sandwich. Do you remember the story of the little boy who brought his loaves and fishes and Jesus multiplied them? Sometimes what we do seems very, very small. It seems insignificant. But actually, God uses the very small. He needs something to work on. So the boy that brought his loaves and fishes as his little picnic, it was his picnic, his fish sandwiches if you want, actually the fact that he gave them to Jesus, it was multiplied and we can start small. We can start small. I was thinking about, there's a story about Elisha uh, and the widow in 2 Kings 4. And in fact, she uh, has two sons. She's got to pay off a whole lot of debt. She said, what shall I do? And Elisha says, what have you got? And she says, I've got a little bit of oil. So he says, bring, bring loads of jars into your house. So she went and she went into the recycling bin and she got out her old peanut butter jars and the um, and then she found the sort of the buckets that she used to do her washing in and um, the old, old Coke bottle and something. She brought all these bottles and then Elisha says, now, you know, the little bit of oil you've got, pour it into the bottles. And as long as she kept bringing in the recipients, the, 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 uh, the bowls and the basins, it was filled up. And I think that is what God wants to do. We are thinking about, we are just starting to church plant again at a place called Wavre. And really, you know, last time, I think we've done four meetings there once a month. And there's lots of young people that come and sort of have lots, lots, eight. You know, it's not lots, comparatively lots. <laughs> Um, but the thing is, we just have to start somewhere. God is, you know, it, he sort of he gravitates towards people who are doing stuff. Even if it's little, he wants something to happen. So when the time comes that you think, oh, maybe we should do something at, I don't know, is it Burford? Is that the name? You know, we need to do something there. You just be five or six of you, but do something. God gravitates towards people who are already doing something because that he's you're saying okay lord we're here we're ready i put my hand up put my hand up to do something and then god says okay there's something there if there's nothing there at all god has got nothing it's like a magnet he's got nothing for his holy spirit to to to, um, to latch on to it's really important you know it's really important um so we have to do what we can do and the rest you know is all of god is all of God, and he does what he alone can do, which is far more than our, than what we are doing. So I just, what, you know, I think what God is doing here is amazing from what I gather. Um, it's absolutely amazing. And, you know, we need to be, this is, guess the play? Yeah, Midsummer Night's Dream, yes, guess the play. You know, we need to be actors and not spectators. Um, for those, there's a theologian called N.T. Wright who's back in Oxford now. And he says that God's, there's a big story and it's a bit like a Shakespearean play with five acts. So act one is creation. Act two was the fall. Act three was Israel and, and their, who, 
we're supposed to be there to demonstrate God's glory and to bring others into the knowledge of God. Didn't do too well on that. Then there was Jesus that came. And then Act 5, that's us. We are actors in Act 5. We are writing the bit after Acts. We're writing that under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And God's got a plan. And we know what the end of the play is. We know what it is. Jesus comes back, new heavens and new earth. But we're in the middle. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that amazing? And I don't think it's totally prescriptive. I, I think there's a sort of freedom there. We don't know. I don't know how sovereignty of God and man's free will and all that. But, but we, are, we can move. We are in Act 5 of this play. We're writing, you're writing it here in Carterton. We're writing it in Brussels. Young, old. That's what we're doing. It's superb. So we are actors and not spe- spectators. I think that's really Im- impossible is really important. Uh, The next one. Um, And then the certain expectations that we need to have as we are in a local church that is seeing further. We need to have an expectation of growth. (laughs) When you have an expectation of growth, you think, what we're living is amazing. I, I love churches of this size because you can know everybody. You see if there's somebody new there. You see if somebody's not there. It was lovely. We were six, six years about in a church of, of this size. It was bigger than in our living room, but it wasn't so big that you just didn't, couldn't recognize you know, if people were absent or, or present. So it's a brilliant thing, but I don't know if this is good news or bad news. <laughs> God will give you growth. God will give you growth and it will be different. You know, are you willing for that? Are we willing for that for the kingdom? Are we willing for that for God's glory? Because what we, what you experience here, God wants other people to experience. Somebody made room for you at some point, and you sort of um, disturb the cozy cuddle. You know, people will come in and disturb the cozy cuddle. We we see we see church planting as being an overflow of life. Actually, that's how we see it. So, in fact, the, the plant that we're starting just to the east of Brussels, it's we've mainly based on our small group where there's a lot of life and we're just sort of going to Wavre once a month, just expressing life there and waiting, hoping, praying <laughs> that God will pour his favour upon it. It's just an express, just an overflow of life. And you've got life here, life that loads of people need. And God will probably ask some of you at some point, perhaps once a month, you know, it won't be an abrupt, abrupt break, breaking of fellowship because fellowship stays. But there might be new things. There might be a different way that you will experience this, this fellowship. So expect growth and talk about it. And don't think it's a bad thing. It's a good thing. It glorifies God. We are... Oh, it's me. On a journey... We're on a journey. I think this is very helpful language to to use. We're on a journey. I'll try and finish now. We're on a journey and we're inviting others to join us. It's there's all sorts of ways of presenting the of presenting the the gospel. Sometimes it's very much them and us. You're not a Christian, and we are Christians, and there's a line to cross to go from one side to the other. Now that is there is a truth in that, but is that the first thing that we need to say to people? who are like coming here. Is that the first thing we need to say? I think a more helpful way to say, and what we say is we're all on a journey. We're all on a journey. We're all imperfect. We've all got progress to make. Let's journey together. And as I, I like the bit when um, Moses says to his father in law Jephro, come with us and we will do you good. And that's our attitude. I think it's a really helpful attitude. Come with us. You know, we've got a good thing going here. We're joyful, we've got life. Come with us and we will do you good. And then, as people journey with us, they start to realise, oh, these people have got, oh, oh, I thought I was a Christian, but actually I realise that actually it's not quite what I thought. And then they'll begin to do alpha courses, then they'll begin to talk, ask questions and everything. And as they read the Bible, it becomes clear, okay, there is a step to be taken. But if you think about it, you know, sometimes we're a little bit too, I think it's confrontational. I know there's a confrontation between light and darkness, but that doesn't mean to say we have to confront people <laughs> like that. Jesus said to the disciples, just follow me. He didn't say, you bad people, you know, you need to repent. He did say repent. Obviously he said repent, but that was turning round. Sometimes we've said, 
we've been a bit harsh in our presentation of the gospel. And I think in this day and age, there's an awful lot of confrontation. There's an awful lot of division between people. Let's try and be people that gather rather than people that separate. So we're on a journey. Um, we are inclusive. Um, we're inclusive. That means we need to be aware of new people. If you have new people here, please. My favourite one is Maranatha. There's some songs that talk about Maranatha, um, which means come, Lord, come. But if we don't explain that, like I like to say, you could be singing Hakuna Matata. You know, people, people come in, they don't know what it means. You know, if you're talking about people that you know, like the OCC Oxford, explain a little bit what it is. You're talking about somebody called Steve Thomas, who, you know, maybe some people know, some people don't. Explain. It doesn't take long. It doesn't mean to say you're visitor friendly and that you're, you're submitting everything so that the visitors feel comfortable. But at least help, help people to feel included. Don't exclude them unnecessarily. Billy Graham, even some people might not know who Billy Graham was. Explain it. Explain. Billy Graham was a, an evangelist. <laughs> Extraordinary evangelist for any people who don't know. Is, was. No, he was. He's died. <laughs> but extraordinary. And loads of people perhaps in this room were influenced by him. Um, be inclusive in, a, in, in what we say. Be careful, especially in, in small groups around the tables as well. Around the table. Sometimes we're on our best behavior in the church meeting. But when we're around the table, we let our guard drop a bit. And we can just say so-and-so was... Did you know that so-and-so was that? And I, I won't go into sort of what we can say. But it can be a way of rejecting new people. Nearly finished. Um, so we're a people of prayer and the Bible. Try and be... Um, what should I say? Let's try and be inclusive in our prayer as well so it's not just the good prayers that pray but it, but everybody can come try and make a way of doing it do a, do a guide for 30 minutes of prayer or have a prayer chain we we've done the Pete greg thing 24 7 that's that's great um we sometimes this is perhaps a thought for you we instead of doing a no, normal service we do a prayer sunday so if you can't get the people to the prayer meeting you bring the prayer meeting to the people and it actually works well. We did it not very long ago, and we had a painting. We had some painting, paints and everything. The kids could get involved, and it worked really well. We had stations, and let, let's try and help everybody to pray. Not to presume that, that everybody's going to pray like us. Make it creative. That's really important, this inclusivity. Um, yeah, and so that, that's the, you know, we are people of prayer and the Bible. And then finally, I think this is the final. We are intentionally creating community. I don't know how you do it. We eat together. Meals are really important. Try and invite people to your house. Try and invite people who are not just the same, not just the same as you. Invite them. It, Jesus ate with people a lot. I know it's partially the culture, the, the, East, the Middle Eastern culture, but maybe it's something we can learn. We can learn it from the African cultures as well. You know, there's people eat together. There's big gatherings. You know, my house is your house. We're a bit insular in the UK. You know, and, and if we're going to, it's not that difficult, actually. People will not look to see whether you know, there's dust around or not. You know, it's not, they won't bother. <laughs> We've all done that, haven't we? Sort of, oh, people are going, I'll just shove it all, everything in the spare room or something. I heard somebody that, that, that she used to shove all her dirty dishes into the oven if people were coming, just to hide them, you know. <laughs> I did that once to somebody. I was in somebody's house and I went to use the bathroom, you know, and obviously that was where she shoved everything. <laughs> so it was just full, full of stuff. But, but, you know, people are, people come to be with us, just to be with us. They don't even come, they don't come for the food. They just come to be with us. So let's try and have open homes. It's a real key for, for building community intentionally. So as our um, small groups, life groups, I know you have those. That is brilliant. Try and be part of it. Try and be part of one. It, they are for you, but you're also there for somebody else. Yeah. If you, you know, it doesn't work unless you're there. Um, so that is, that is important. Um, so that's, that's something for all of us, isn't it? How can I create community? If you like, for example, the sewing bee or bake-off, why not at the final invite people around to watch it with you? You know, and then you can invite your, your non-church friends to you as well. It's just these little things. Everybody, but everybody is an actor. Everybody can do it. Um, you might think, I've got nothing to give. But yes, you have. Of course you have. And we're not going to build the kingdom. We're not going to do what God wants. You're not going to do what God wants for Carterton unless everybody is involved. So I've just come to the end now. That, that was our last church weekend. I think there was about 180 of us there. Um, 
So God has really blessed us. We started off, as I say, we stayed about this size for quite a long time, which is very comfortable. It's very nice. And I mean, I love it. I just love being, you know, not talking to people who are miles away. And, but God wants more. God wants more because he's a great God. And he's got plans. And there's a, there's a world, as I said, that is suffering and needs to know that there's a God who loves them, that a God who is for them, a God who has given his life for them. So as he, as he said, you know, he said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. Be in the world, not of the world, but that's what God wants for us. That's what God wants for you. It's what God wants for us in Brussels. That's what he wants. For, in fact, for, oh, I keep going to French. That's what he wants for people all over the world, all over the world. And we, you, have the privilege of being here. You have the privilege. I haven't got the jigsaw because Anna, not Anna, Olivia, I brought a jigsaw actually to sew little pieces, but then Olivia started doing the jigsaw. She's my granddaughter, so I didn't bring my jigsaw. We all have a part. We all have a piece of the puzzle. And in fact, if you don't play your part, the person next to you can't play their part either. So everybody is an actor. Everybody is an actor. No spectators. Please, please, please don't underestimate what you can do. No matter your age, whether you're 12, 13, 14, whether you're in your 80s, everybody has a part to play. And it's that way that God, that the big picture, the big puzzle will start to be made and people will come, and people will come and will discover our amazing God, and all the glory will go to him. Amen. Amen.